Welcome to Academic Job Search Overview. My name is Kay Gruder. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm Assistant Director of Graduate Student and Postdoc Career Programs and Services located at UConn's Center for Career Development at the STORES campus. And before we get started, I'd like to go over a few of uh, ways that you can participate in the webinar. You should see your attendee interface on your computer desktop. Typically, it's in the left hand, upper left hand corner and you will have the opportunity to submit questions. You'll do this by just typing your questions into the chat pane of the control panel, and you uh, may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. And since this is previously uh, recorded, these questions will then be emailed to me, and I'll answer them within three to five business days. Note uh, also that a recording of today's webinar will be emailed to you within 24 hours. And there is a short evaluation that will appear at the end of the webinar for you to complete. So let's get started. In this webinar, we will cover content that provides an overview of some of the major aspects of conducting an academic job search. The content is tailored to doctoral candidates seeking faculty positions. Others are free to join in and listen. During our session, we will discuss a common timeline for launching and managing your search, and that will be uh, a timeline within the US. We will review factors to consider as you identify opportunities. Uh, we'll learn about a few key job search sites and review some of the faculty job titles that, that are out there and briefly review common application components. There is a separate webinar focused on academic job application materials. So we're going to touch upon the job application materials in this webinar, but that is not the primary focus. So let's start by looking at a common application timeline. And again, I'm sharing this uh, within the US context. In determining the timeline, it is really important to know when academic positions start to get posted for your field. So one field of study might have postings as early as August. Uh, the, and that would be the year before they wish to fill the position. And another field of study might only begin posting positions in October. So while academic positions get posted on and off throughout the year, it is really most common for the majority of positions to get posted between nine and 13 months before the position would actually begin at the institution. So it's really important to know what is common to your field of study. It is uh, really in mid-summer -su and early fall that academic job openings uh, for faculty positions are most often posted. They may appear within a career section of a society's website. Uh, they may be on a job resource site that's focused on positions within academia. You can sometimes find positions directly on the institution's website, usually uh, within the human resources uh, department, but also you can find postings sometimes on the academic department's website. Usually if it's on the academic department's website, you will also find it on the human resources website. Listservs uh, that are specific to your field may also post jobs. And now we are even seeing uh, academic jobs on LinkedIn. And I say even seeing because a few years ago, we would not have seen those positions appearing uh, in the job section of LinkedIn. And I'm just going to share an example of each of these so you have a sense of, of, what, of what this might look like. 
So here's an example of a job posting that uh, it's an actual whole job posting area within a professional society's website. And this is the American Historical Association. And you can see it's set up with uh, a section for job seekers and a section for employers. And sometimes in these sections, we also see really good information like career tips um, to help you as you um, move ahead with your search. The next slide is an example of one of the many online job resources that's focused on positions within higher ed. And uh, in this by category section here, you can see that faculty is one of the categories and you can search by location, uh, state, metropolitan region, type of institution and so forth. Here's an example of a posting on an institution's website. And this is appearing on UConn's human resource uh, site. Uh, and you would click to get the, the full job posting. Some sites have their own registration process in order to apply for jobs. You apply through uh, the platform that they're using to gather uh, applicant materials. Here's an example of a job posting that was on a department's website. And this was at UCLA, and it was within the sociology department. This is an example of how a listserv could have a job opening section. This is a listserv for the Connecticut GIS discussion list. And you'll see here um, in the, the uses of the list that posting job openings is, is one of the features there. And then finally, let's look at LinkedIn. And um, this is just an example of how postings appear in LinkedIn. Okay, and I circled some here just to help those stand out on the list. It's really common for a job to be posted in several places. So it's important as a job applicant to be looking on a few different sites. And like anything, you will have your favorite sites. You know, you'll have your two favorite higher education sites or a listserv or a professional society. You, you'll, you'll develop a sense of which sites are um, showing postings that are of um, most, most interest to you. All right, so continuing with midsummer and early fall, application materials are usually submitted to the hiring committees throughout the fall. And each institution will have its own deadlines and its own requirements for what materials need to be submitted. And as I mentioned, we'll just be touching upon materials a bit later in, in this webinar. Sometimes the application materials are sent directly to a point of contact uh, 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 on the hiring committee. Sometimes, like I mentioned, it can be through a platform that human resources at the institution is using. And sometimes we see that applications get uh, submitted to a dossier service and Interfolio is, is one of those. During December into February, but sometimes it can be earlier, the first round of interviews will occur usually by video or uh, if there's a annual conference or annual meeting uh, around that time, uh, first round interviews may, may um, occur at those events. And then it's pretty common to have on-campus interviews occurring in January through early March or so. Okay. The on-campus interviews 
uh, typically occur for a select group of finalists and most institutions bring their top three, maybe top four, for candidates to the institution. March and beyond is when offers are typically made, but if an institution started the interview process and posting of the job uh, in, the, in the summer, they may make offers as early as December or January. I worked with a, a few students in this cycle who had offers in hand the, the first and second weeks of December. Uh, if, if a search has failed in hiring a candidate, they may repost in the spring or revisit the list of, of candidates. But typically, we see offers are made uh, March in that late February, March time period and beyond. And those are offers uh, for positions that start typically in August. So as we look at that timeline, you can probably already get a sense that it's really important to have some coordination management of your applications, uh, especially when you're applying to multiple positions. It becomes really critical to stay organized and to have a system in place. I always suggest using a system that has worked for you in the past when you've had to organize applications um, or specific materials for maybe a fellowship or something, something like that. So do something that's been done that has been working for you. Um, you might find that a spreadsheet is useful. Um, it's really important perhaps to keep individual folders for each institution and each position within each institution. It's important to label and save your documents with, with your name, the type of document it, it is, and, and then the institution that it's for, because often you're tailing, tailoring your documents um, for one institution and then for, for another institution. And uh, a product like Interfolio, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, is, a, is a product that the institutions sometimes use as a way to coordinate all the application materials that they're getting. It is also available uh, to individuals to use as well. Um, and sometimes you'll load your, your application materials right into Interfolio, and then the hiring institution can review those materials. Your, uh, ref, the individuals who are references for you, writing letters of recommendation, they are often asked to upload their uh, letters into Interfolio. So there are, there are a, a few different products out there. Um, but Interfolio is one of the more popular. And again, there is a way to um, utilize it. There's portions of it are free. So you can utilize portions of Interfolio as, an in, as just an individual. All right, now we're going to shift from timeline and organization of your search materials to considering different factors that might influence or direct your search for positions. Uh, being able to consider factors is quite honestly not always an option. Sometimes you have to go where the job is, interview for that job, um, and sort of take what you can get. Uh, but we, we know that um, Basically, the research shows that when individuals experience a strong fit with their work and also the community in which they're living, they are usually more energized and productive. So I do recognize that being able to consider these kinds of factors is not always an option. Um, and at times when you can, it's definitely worth 
considering one or more of these. Okay, so I'll dive into some of these. All right, so the first factor, I call them fit factors, is the institution and the department. And it's thinking about the kind of institution and department in which you want to, to work. So maybe you're gonna focus your search on R1 institutions or maybe teaching intensive institutions. Maybe you're looking for a department that's growing um, maybe the, the course offerings or it's introducing a new major. And quite a bit of that you can find on the institution's uh, website. Geographic area can be another uh, fit factor. Sometimes it's really important where you live. Maybe you know you need or want to be in an urban area, a rural area, suburban area. And along with the geographic area really comes a local community, which we'll also talk about. When we talk about position and fit, uh, initially that could be about the job posting. Is it a, a research position with some teaching? Is it a visiting position? Uh, is it a position that's more focused on teaching and less on research? Uh, so these are some factors to consider when, when you have the chance to look at the, the type of position. Now, when we look at local community, we know that community can be really important to your quality of life. Um, I've worked with students who've said, you know, I need a hospital nearby, or I need a, a, an international airport nearby, or a religious place of worship. So these are some additional considerations. And certainly if you're um, traveling to, to uh, an on-site interview, you can be getting a, a really strong sense, build in some time. So, uh, you know, a half day on either side of the, the interview maybe, where you can start to get a sense of the geographic area and certainly the local community. And then something that people uh, often don't think about because we're so focused on just getting this job now, right, um, is, to look at the opportunities in terms of how well do you feel that the positions that you're applying to can support your future plans. Um, and we're gonna look at each of these a little bit more as well. Okay, so if you're looking at different institutions, uh, in particular, these Carnegie classifications can be really useful. Uh, these are classifications that talk about the percentage of undergraduate instruction at the university or college, the enrollment profile, the size and setting, and, and so forth. So this is kind of a go-to classification system uh, that you can access and um, learn quite a bit about, about the institution. You can also use the institution's website to try and figure out things like the department size, what do the labs look like, is there mention of funding. You can go on the admissions site at the institution to learn about the student population. You can check uh, news sources for other information maybe about uh, the ranking, uh, opportunities where the university or college is growing and, and so forth. So a combination of resources here, but helps to give you a, a better picture of the institution. When considering your fit with a position, try to determine what percentage of time will be spent on which aspects of the job. 
All right. And so this is where we say, okay, is it mostly research? Is it mostly teaching? What are some of the expectations in terms of service to the institution, publishing, gaining grants to support your future research and uh, so on. And then also be looking at, you know, the background of the department chair. A lot of times you can find CVs, right, of these individuals that would be your future um, colleagues. You can find those within the department website or even through some of the uh, research uh, sites that exist out there. Um, but it's important to look at the, the department site uh, to see kind of what research is being done, what courses are being taught, and so forth. With the geographic area, I added some links here to websites that provide information about areas inside, um, geographic areas inside and outside the US. And a lot of these sites include things like cost of living, crime, uh, and so forth. And a local chamber of commerce sometimes has great resources that provide an overview of the area especially the businesses that exist there. And if, if you're part of a faith-based or other type of affinity group, you might find connecting with that same type of organization uh, in, in the location where you'd be going to the interview uh, would, be, would be useful because then you could connect with actual people uh, who could speak about uh, what the area is like. And if time and finances allow, sometimes a trip to the location is the best way to begin to understand if the fit is, is what you thought it would be. So by that I mean like maybe, maybe you thought, oh, I only want to apply to um, institutions in California and the state of Washington. But if you've never been there, you know, you might find out something otherwise. So it's this idea, and again, I recognize not everyone has the ability um, to coordinate a, a trip to, to check out an area. Taking time about, like to think about the community in which you want or need to reside can be important. Uh, if you have school-aged children, you might need to explore school systems, or perhaps you know you need to use public transportation, or you need easy access to medical services. And these are all components of community that you might need or want to factor in. And while we spend a lot of time at our work, being comfortable in our community often makes for a less stressful uh, way of life. So, let's see. And now we're going to revisit that idea of future plans. Uh, you know, as, as you think about what's important to you in data, day life, it, it is also important to think about your future plans. So when you're applying to jobs, you might want to ask yourself two consistent questions. One question is, in what ways does this job get me closer to what I see as my future position? And I'll say that again. In what ways does this job support uh, in what ways does this job get me closer to what I see as my future position? And then a second question is, in what ways does this job support some of my other goals? And those other goals could be financial goals, family goals, uh, other educational goals, lifestyle goals, and, and so forth. So two good questions to, to keep in mind. These fit factors uh, are a lot to think about. So I'm gonna give you five tips for focusing on your best fit. 
first tip is to write down in detail what your best fit situation or situations look like. Really try to capture, imagine, identify uh, what your life would look like in a best fit situation. And then it's great to indicate the order of your priorities. So maybe um, location isn't important to you. Um, but the kind of department and position are important to you. I like to think of priorities as this is something I must have, this would be a nice to have, this really doesn't may matter, or if this other thing um, exists or doesn't exist, it could be a, a major pro uh, problem. And then talk with others who know you well, and even some people who don't know you as well to gather what they hear you saying is important to you. And utilize all your resources to try and discern fact from fiction. And so, you know, do that research and um, each of the fit factors slides in the presentation uh, has some links to resources or most of those slides do. And then assess what you're learning along the way and make adjustments. So you may have thought one thing initially, but then after doing some research or doing a site visit, you realize something else is actually more of a priority. So it's really important to be assessing throughout the process. All right. Now I'd like to mention a few of the popular academic job search sites, and there are a lot of these. And we don't have time to visit them in this webinar, but when you receive a copy of the webinar, you'll be able to visit any of the websites of interest. And like I said earlier, you will have your go-to sites where you just always go to this site and that site to look for the kinds of jobs uh, that you're seeking. Most of the sites do allow you to search by geographic location, field of study, and type of position. So I'm just going to pop some of these sites up here. All right. The Chronicle of Higher Ed has its own job site, Chronicle Vitae, and it is similar to higher ed jobs and inside higher ed, you will see a lot of the same jobs posted on all three of these sites, two of these sites. Um, you will, will see some repetition uh, among, the, among the postings. The Higher Education Recruitment Consortium is another great site. What I particularly like about HERC, as we call it, is that there are geographic regions set up and you can look at jobs within those geographic regions. So you can look nationally, but then you can also focus on, let's say, southern states or New England um, or mid-Atlantic. Haystack is just an interesting site and also can be pretty useful. It is more of an organization. It is called the Humanities, Art, Science, and Technology Alliance and Collaboratory, but it does have a job posting area with faculty positions. So it's a bit of an outlier uh, and at the same time it, it tends to have some pretty interesting positions. Often I'll see things come up in like digital humanities, if, if that's an area of, of interest, but also technology, um, other areas of technology uh, as well. So these are some of the more popular sites. Um, they are like my go-to sites when I'm working with students and students and postdocs have shared that they have found these sites to also be of uh, value to them. Now, as you look at the job postings, you will notice all types of positions being listed. And 
Unfortunately, you cannot assume that one position at one university is exactly the same at another university. Uh, for, as an example, a visiting professor at one institution might have a two-year contract, while at another institution, it might have a one-year contract. But basically, any job title that begins with visiting is usually referring to a position that is temporary in nature, but that's about the only thing that you can be certain of because those variations exist from institution to institution. Adjunct positions are part-time. Usually these are without any benefits of being part of faculty. And at some institutions, adjuncting faculty have leveraged some faculty rights, but it still is not the norm. A lecturer position might have full-time status. It could be someone that ha is ABD, all but dissertation, or perhaps the position only requires a master's degree. And uh, an instructor has typically completed most or all of their requirements for the doctorate. And most commonly, it is an entry-level rank position uh, it's common to have for new faculty have that title for new faculty uh, and especially faculty who have the potential for academic advancement and then when we look at positions listed as tenure track the individual is usually hired as an assistant professor they achieve tenure, promoted to associate, and then full professor. But again, the job titles and pathways to tenure can be actually very different from institution to institution. And sometimes a university or college will have the descriptions of the faculty titles on their website. And I've seen that posted in human resources, most common most most commonly but um, not all institutions do this all right in the last section of the webinar we're going to talk about the areas of preparation required to be a competitive job candidate and there's a lot to prepare you must prepare you uh, your materials and you must also prepare others. And we'll begin with the written materials for the application. And we're just briefly discussing these materials. And we do have that other webinar that goes into more detail about how to prepare some of the primary application materials. The most common written materials or the CV, cover letter, or sometimes it's called a letter of intent. And these can be very specific in that the hiring committee can give very specific directions about the content that they want in this letter that accompanies your packet or your CV. I've seen this more and more where the hiring committee is saying, um, include a cover letter and tell us about your commitment to diversity and inclusion and, or write a cover letter and tell us about your five-year plan. Uh, sometimes that information is in other documents, but I've started to see more and more directives being given with the cover letter and letter of intent. Teaching statement, you discuss your teaching philosophy, and more importantly, you will want to use examples to show how you teach. You want the hiring committee to be able to basically close their eyes and imagine you in the classroom. Research statement is another common document. And what I see here most often is that people spend a lot of time writing about their past and very little time writing about their 
research moving forward. And if you think about it, the institution that's hiring you, yes, they need to, to know, um, you know that you have a strong research foundation. And what they really want to know is who are you going to be at that institution? So it is really important to be very sort of forward, forward moving, forward thinking in that research statement. We see diversity statements more and more office, I mean more and more often, and um, you can basically the statements can encompass a range of diversity. Sometimes it's showing examples of the way you've engaged in diversity and inclusion, whether it's in your teaching, your research service, or, or other involvements. And letters of recommendation are also part of the written materials, though you don't write them. Uh, when you ask someone to be a reference or write a letter of recommendation, it can be really important to share with them what you hope they can highlight about your knowledge, your skills, your, your, your training. Um, so these are the, the primary written materials. And then there are a lot of additional materials. All right, we have teaching portfolio, teaching evaluations, and a sample syllabus, or sometimes syllabi. Sometimes a hiring committee will ask for the portfolio, and you would have your evaluations, and you would have sample syllabi in that portfolio, typically. But sometimes the hiring com committees are just asking for one or two of, of these um, items. If you're applying to a faith-based college or university, they may uh, ask for a statement of faith. And really what they're asking for is how you intend to uphold the faith-based values of that university or college in your work there. I've also seen hiring committees ask for a statement of contribution. I've begun seeing this more and more in the work that I've been doing with, with applicants. And basically, it, it focuses on the ways you can and will contribute to the larger community at the university or even within the local community if that is something that's strongly valued by the institution. We also see research budgets, sometimes a teaching video, uh, uh, and a writing sample. And there are other uh, materials that pop up from time to time, but I'm providing you with those that are, are a little more common. Along with all the written materials, you'll also want to be prepared to present yourself in lots of different ways. And you will want to practice your job talk, chalk talk, research talk, whatever it's, whatever they're calling it. You'll also want to be prepared to teach a class. Sometimes the content is your choice. They'll, they'll say to you, oh, teach something you enjoy teaching. Other times they'll say, you're going to be part of Dr. So-and-so's class, and we'd like you to do a teaching segment on fill in the blank. They'll, they'll tell you what they want you to, to, uh, to teach. Another way to prepare is to uh, anticipate and practice interview questions and learn about illegal or inappropriate questions. Some states have different rules on what's illegal in terms of the kinds of questions that can be asked of somebody. Practice talking about your dissertation, your research, your teaching, your future interests. When I suggest that people practice interview questions, it's not to come up with 200 questions and have answers. It's really to do this step here about talking about your dissertation, your research, your teaching, your future interests, yourself. And then the questions become a little less important because 
you have developed examples um, that you can use to answer the different kinds of questions that might be asked of you. And then identify aspects of you that make you memorable. You know, maybe you have experience in A, and that's really important to the job, but you also have some experience in B, which could be really interesting to the hiring committee because maybe they're thinking of a way to collaborate with the department uh, that you have some secondary knowledge or experience or research in. So really think about, you know, what, what makes me a different candidate than the other two candidates that they're bringing on campus. And you don't necessarily know who those two other candidates are, but you can take time to think about what what can I leverage? What is unique uh, to me and, and what I bring? Get comfortable with social events is another way to prepare to present. And you might as well do that here at the university or in your community, uh, because that's certainly a more comfortable area to uh, prepare uh, to, to get comfortable with social events. A lot of the on site interviews that students are coming back from have had like a large group meet and greet kind of event where the candidate is in a room and there are 50 or 60 faculty, students, student leaders, institution leaders uh, at the event coming up, greeting, uh, asking quick questions of the candidate. And so really taking time in leading up to your uh, on-site interviews, it's really, really important to get comfortable with social events. And then know the places to which you apply inside and out, because then when you present yourself, you're going to be presenting yourself in relationship to what you know about the um, institutions. All right, now we're in the home stretch here. In addition to preparing uh, you and preparing your materials, you do have to prepare and inform others. And you'll want to choose your recommenders carefully and give people the opportunity to say no. And you really just have to kind of be upfront and say, you know, I'm applying, I'm, you know, going into the application cycle. I'd really value you as a, a recommender. Um, and my, my hope is that you could talk about my abilities to do A and B. And I'm wondering if you would be able to um, take on that role. And you know, allow your recommenders to say yes or no. It's really important to provide the recommenders with information about the positions you're applying to, the institutions you're applying to, and they should have an up-to-date copy of your CV at a minimum. And as I mentioned earlier, always share if there's an aspect that you would like the recommender to focus on. You don't want to be in a situation where you, let's say you have three to five letters of reference or three to five recommenders, and you don't want to be in the situation where they're all saying the same thing about you. That's really a missed opportunity. So you could say to one person, oh, I'd really value if you could share about this aspect of who I am as a researcher. And then for another recommender, oh, I'd love for you to be able to speak about my teaching and how I took over your, your um, course halfway through the semester when, when you weren't able to be there. So People usually appreciate some guidance because it also helps them write a really good uh, letter. And then you want to keep your recommenders up updated. Let them know, oh, I've moved on to this uh, part of the process, or I got a Skype interview, or I've been invited for an on-campus uh, visit because they are often part of your career uh, team 
and they are they believe in you and they want to see you succeed and so sharing updates of all kinds is really useful um, to them and also to you to you in in the process and then you really want to know who your resources are certainly an advisor or another mentor junior faculty in the department can um, be a great resource because often they have most recently been on the job market uh, and so they can share some almost real-time information about what it was like for them and, and tips and whatnot. The Writing Center here at the University of Connecticut, the Center for Career Development, the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, you know, are all here to support you in various aspects of your uh, academic job application process and then a lot of the professional and academic associations have quite a bit of content career content to help prepare you as well what we know is that to succeed and move through the process with confidence you know you must be prepared and it's also true that if you can't prepare in a significant way, it's sometimes better to wait out a cycle and start start the process maybe a year, year later. And then ultimately confidence is key. And so if you're prepared, you'll be confident. Um, and it's it's really critical to the success of of the process. This wraps up academic job search overview, and I'd like to invite you to book an appointment with the Center for Career Development to further develop your plan, to work on your um, application materials, however we can be of assistance. And as a final note, you will be emailed a recording of the webinar, and that will occur in the next 24 hours. A brief evaluation is also going to pop up at the end of this webinar. It would be really, really great if you could answer the, I think there are four questions on, on the evaluation. And all the best as you continue on your career journey.